Want to listen to this Ivory Tower Boiler Room or True Crime and Academia episode ad free? Head on over to our Patreon, p a t r e o n dot com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room to listen to all of our podcast episodes without any ads. You get access to our video episodes, our bonus episodes, and even more exclusive content, including merchandise. It only starts at five dollars a month, so head on over to our Patreon. Again, it's p a t r e o n dot com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And while you're at it, you know what would be such a help is if you could rate and review the Ivory Tower Boiler Room on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and make sure that you follow us and share out our podcast to all of your friends. It truly does help, and I want to thank you all. It means so much that you're listening to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and before you hear such an exciting episode, I want to remind you all that when I'm not here hosting the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, I am running my small business, the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, where I am consulting with clients. It includes academic writing, consulting, social media, podcast, and expanding your media footprint. So, I have clients. I'm working on graduate school writing with them. I can work on thesis writing, dissertation writing, essay advice, college admission essays, undergrad. Uh, college advice, graduate school advice. I also am working on a client's small business right now and expanding her social media footprint. I can work on how to create a podcast with you or how to expand your podcast audience. I also can just help you expand your media footprint in general. So, if you're interested in my consulting. I first want to let you all know it is only thirty dollars for the first hour that I work with you on consulting, and then I'll set up a package with you then. So you can email me at ivorytowerboilerroom at gmail dot com, or you could go to our Patreon p a t r e o n dot com backslash ivorytowerboilerroom, and there's a consulting option under mem- memberships. You can pay the thirty dollars, and then I will reach out to you right away, and we'll set up a consultation. And then, while you're on our Patreon, make sure you join the Ivory Tower Boiler Room and the True Crime and Academia Book Club. Every month, both myself and Mary are choosing books for our book club members to read, and we are actually polling our members on Patreon to see what books they want to read, and we're meeting with them the first week of each month. So, if you want to join. Um, the book club each month. Just make sure that you join on Patreon. That way, I know who's joined, and I can reach out to all of you and let you know when we're meeting on Zoom. Okay, so lots of things to do here in the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, and I can't wait to consult with you, join you for a book club discussion, and have you here listening to one of our podcast episodes. Okay, enjoy this episode. True Crime friends, welcome back to another episode of True Crime in Academia. I am your host, Mary DePippi. I hope you all had a wonderful week this week, and I hope you have a restful weekend that is upon us. I am hoping to get out and explore the Farmer's Mart and hopefully get some pumpkins and do some pumpkin carving and, you know, just really partaking in the fall season because I haven't really done that yet and well mainly just because I've been busy so it's like the first weekend that I'm like (sighs) gonna be in like full relaxation mode and I'm so excited for it so yeah so that's what I'm up to I hope you all are doing similar or you know the things that you enjoy 
This week's news update is going to be a little on the shorter side just because our case is a little bit longer. Um, This particular case that we will be covering, the situation surrounding it is very complicated and a lot different than we've ever talked about, sort of. Um, We've touched on it here and there, but in this one specifically, it was a more perfect example of the situ or you know um this particular situation so without any further ado let's get into this news update so this first story is an update on a case from back in 2005 it was extremely well known in the news it is a case that i will be covering at some point so i am happy that there is some sort of conclusion to this In case you aren't sure, this is the Natalie Holloway case. Jordan Vandersloot finally admitted to his role in her disappearance and murder. He confessed to authorities in complete detail how he bludgeoned the teen when she was on her graduation trip with her class in Aruba. This confession comes after Vandersloot pleaded guilty in Alabama federal <laughs> Alabama Alabama federal court to extortion and fraud of the Holloway family. For those of you again who don't know, he had tried to get two hundred and fifty thousand dollars from Natalie Holloway's mother Beth in exchange for information and location of Natalie's body. He was sentenced to twenty years in prison for the financial crimes and is to be serving his sentence simultaneously with another murder sentence that he is currently serving in Peru. Now, despite the confession, he might not be charged with Natalie's murder. And here's why. Aruba, because that's where she was killed, sadly, would have jurisdiction over this case and did have jurisdiction over the case. So the U.S. can't prosecute him for that crime because they have no jurisdiction. The other reason is that the Aruba um, statute of limitations for murder have passed as far as this case is concerned. So, like I said, most likely he won't be charged for that. Um, You know, but he did confess. And, you know, regardless, the Holloway family has expressed their relief in finally knowing, you know, who killed her. And, you know, hopefully... This offers some sort of closure for all of them. This next case update is not really like a case. It's kind of something that happened. No charges have been pressed, even though this incident is in legal filings. Um, Last week, Cher finally responded to the allegations made against her by her daughter-in-law, that she had orchestrated the kidnapping of her 47-year-old son, Elijah Blue Allman. Cher states that this is not at all true and that the men involved were there for an intervention for Elijah's addiction problems. She stated that she was terrified for her son's life and needed to do something to get him help. I've seen some other sources state that his soon-to-be ex-wife has also changed her tune a bit and is saying that they were involved in an intervention, but I'm not entirely sure, again, how accurate that is. I haven't seen it everywhere, just here and there. So recently on TikTok, we put out a video about my comments on this case when it first came out, and, you know... Some people have different opinions, and that's fine. I personally still stand by what I said last week. You know, I understand that Cher, you know, Cher's desire to save her child. But at the same time, sending four strange men to his hotel room where he was staying with his wife to try and work on their marriage just doesn't seem to be the best way to do that like it just it does not sit well with me in fact when I first read this case back I think when it um, came to light and was first reported back like end of September I was getting and still I'm getting like reform school vibes like the one Paris Hilton was forced to go to 
you know, because they just kidnap you, take you, and they're allowed to. And unfortunately, you know, other people have gotten it a lot worse, sadly, than Paris Hilton as far as, like, the situation of her being taken from her room, like, basically being kidnapped in front of her parents. You know, some of them are given the okay to, like, just take your kid off the street, like, when they're walking home from school. So, you know, but, like I said, like, this, it just, it does not sit, I'm just not okay with this, you know? I know I'm going to sound harsh again, but, like, I've had addiction touch my life personally, so maybe I'm pessimistic because of that, but in my experience, unless an addict wants to save themselves there is literally nothing else anyone can do nine out of ten times yes you can put someone in rehab like Cher got her son to go to rehab you know I hope to god that Elijah finds a reason to save himself while he's in there and is able to be successful in kicking his addiction but sadly like for a lot of other people like that is just not the case for people who are being told that they have to go or coerced into going or forced into going sadly they're not usually going to be successful sure they'll go to the program they'll get detox they'll you know go through the motions maybe maybe like I said hopefully find some reason but you know they'll get out maybe they'll stay sober for a while or not and go back and again I'm not saying that this is textbook but this is in all of the cases in which it's touched my life (laughs) this is how I've seen it happen so you know the idea of trying to coerce or you know like after a certain point I think there's only so much you can do and like I said it's it's up to the person to want to get themselves help. So, you know, and as I, sorry, so back to what I was saying, like, because there are cases of, like, when they go through the program, they get back out there, maybe they stay sober, but then if and when they do go back, a lot, sadly, their risk of, like, overdosing is so much higher because sometimes they will try to go back to the dose that they were at before detox, and their tolerance that they had is just no longer there. And it winds up being too much and thus the overdose happens. So in that way, I've seen, like I said, I've seen it be a vicious cycle in that way. Unless the person is genuinely wanting to be done. So like I said, it sounds harsh, but I don't, I I just don't agree with what Cher did. I don't, you know, I mean, on top of that, her son is 47 years old. He was there with his wife. His wife ha- seems to not have had much contact with him since then. And at the time, or at least initially, wasn't given the contact in- or information or where he was. So <sighs> in that respect, I mean, they're still married. So, I mean, I don't know that it's. <sighs> It's fucked up to me. The whole thing is fucked up. Like I said, I'm not... I understand why she did it. I just don't think she should have done it. Because again, I don't... (laughs) I don't see how sending four strange men to the hotel room you're staying at with your wife to give you an intervention. Like, that just... That seems like a traumatic experience in and of itself. You know? So, again... That is that is my piece on that situation. You know, Elijah has not said anything about it. Um, I think because he is still in the rehab facility, but he's supposed to have a court case next with his for the divorce um, on October twenty seventh, so next week. But you know, who knows? It might just be his lawyer there for in his place. You know, since he is in rehab. But I'm curious to see what he would have to say if he does decide to speak on it so if he does I will keep you all posted but that is all I have for this news update like I said it was a little short sweet and simple just because this case is a little bit longer so we're going to take a quick break and we will be right back with this week's case
I am here with the co-owner of one of my favorite stores here in Port Jefferson Village, New York. It is called The Soapbox. So Janine said, Andrew, I have these four products you need to get your hands on. It's called Four for Fall. So she's going to go over these four products. I know first you have a soap for me. What is the soap? I, do. I have a soap for you. It is called Apple Cider Shea Butter Soap. It's by a company called Greenwich Bay. And this is a great soap because you can use it for your hands or your body. And it has a delicious apple cider scent. And I think you're actually already familiar with it. Yes, it is Try in it. my shower. I still have it. It lasts a very long time. Yeah, great lather. The lather is wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's just so luxurious. And I love the scent into November. Yes. You know, this apple cider just it evokes so many cozy feelings. After the soap, we have something that you can add on to yes. in the shower. So what is this? This is a wonderful, wonderful um, exfoliating shower scrub. It is by a company called Primal Almonds, and it's a sugar whip shower scrub. And the scent is pumpkin spice. It's a moisturizing sugar scrub. So it's tiny little sugar granules. And it's something that you would use after you shower twice a week because you don't want to strip your skin of your natural um, oils and your your moisture, but it's wonderful. It just really exfoli exfoliates all that dead skin and leaves your skin very so smooth and soft from all the um, the sugar. So after I use the exfoliant right now, we need to moisturize. So yeah. I know you have a really nice fall body lotion for us. Absolutely. Um, this is just such a delicious scent. This is one of my favorites for fall. It is The scent is Orchard Breeze. And it's by a company called Michelle Design Works. Um, this is another product that you can use hand or body, hand and body. Um, it's great. You can place it um, on your vanity, just a couple of pumps for your hands or use it on your entire body. But it's shea butter based. So it's extremely moisturizing. Um, it's, it's just wonderful. And the scent is just lovely. We need something more deep for our face. Everyone yes. wants face masks. And I know that you absolutely love this company and this product. Yes. This is one of my favorite masks by one of my favorite companies that we carry and we support. The company is called Farmhouse Fresh and they're right out of Texas. The mask is called Splendid Dirt and it's a nutrient rich mud mask. Um, it consists of pumpkin puree and the benefits of this mask, uh, it's a pore minimizer, a radiance booster and a skin degunker. So it's an all around great mask. If you really want a boost of radiance, it brightens your skin and it really cleanses your pores. If they live on Long Island or near Long Island, you know, what is your address uh, for them to come into the store? We're located at 18 Chandler Square in Port Jefferson, New York, right in the village. Um, and if you can't make it, you have to come in because we just have so much fun stuff in here. So many wonderful products. Um, but if you can't make it in, please give us a call. We're more than happy to um, ship any of these wonderful, all any of these wonderful products to you. Um, uh, call us at 631-509-1424. You could always um, reach us on Instagram at the soapbox NY, or you could always um, check us out on our website, soapbox NY. Um, and yeah, there's so many ways to access yeah, your so products. Many ways to reach us. And Janine is more than happy. And Mariana. The other co-owner. My mom, actually. Yes. yes my mother. Are so willing to take your orders yes. via phone, via Instagram. And I can't wait for everyone else to enjoy these luxurious products. Are you afraid of the dark? <laughs> Sorry, I had to, everyone. It's Dr. Andrew Rimby. Happy spooky season and gothic and horror. Just all the vibes. I am so excited to talk about Broadview Press, who you might know helps sponsor our podcast. They're an independent publisher in the humanities since 1985. Did you know they have so many horror novels that you need to get your hands on? They have Frankenstein, of course, by Mary Shelley. They have Dracula by Bram Stoker, one of my favorites. They have The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, Edgar Allan Poe's Poetry and Tales. Oh, they just have so many gothic novels that you all need to soak your teeth into. Bob your teeth into <laughs> some kind of Halloween metaphor is appropriate there. They also have academic books like Dr. Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock's The Mad Scientist's Guide to Composition. So if you're a writing professor out there, you need to get your hands on that. And they also have a gift package called Mystery Horror Sensation, which if you don't know what to choose, 
just choose the Mystery Horror Sensation gift package. Just a reminder, you get 20% off on broadviewpress.com, link in our show notes. Just use the code Ivory Tower, all lowercase. Ivory Tower, 20% off all your books on broadviewpress.com, all of them. I can't wait for you all to hear our next Broadview Press guest. It's coming in November. And definitely when you buy one of their horror or gothic novels or books, just make sure you tag us on Instagram at Ivory Tower Boiler Room and tag them too at Broadview Press. I know they'll love to share it. Okay, everyone, be careful if you're reading in the dark. I don't want you to get too scared. Turn a light on. Bye, everyone. Hi, did I mention that it's spooky season? This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and guess what? I have so many Halloween and fall designs and crafts in my apartment. And guess what? There is a person who's made me so many Halloween, horror, fall-themed items, and her name is Mandy Bengal. She owns Mandy Made It, a craft crochet company. So... Mandy talked to me and said, Andrew, I want everyone out there to know that if they mention ITBR and that they heard my ad, that I will give them a free ITBR t-shirt. So make sure you mention ITBR and order from Mandy crocheted pumpkins that she actually is using cinnamon sticks as the stem, which is a brilliant idea. How cozy. And also filling the pumpkins with potpourri. I already want to wrap myself in a blanket. She has Halloween keychains, other Halloween crochet designs. So how can you reach out to her? Go to her Facebook or Instagram, at Mandy Made It. Reach out to her. She will ship items out to you. If you live in the South New Jersey Philly area, she'll arrange to have you either pick it up or deliver it to you. So Mandy just makes such beautiful crocheted items. And I'm so happy that she supports the podcast. I've known Mandy since I was a child. We were in theater camp together. That's how I met Mary. So the three of us have known each other a long time. Okay, head over to Mandy Made It for your handmade crocheted items for this Halloween and fall. On August 1st, 1966, Gunfire rained down from the clock tower at the University of Texas just before noon. For 90 horrifying minutes, students, faculty, and staff near the clock tower were gunned down by a lone shooter. Police arrived shortly after the first shots were fired and were joined by local citizens with guns who wanted to help. Two police officers were able to make their way up to the 27th floor of the tower to where the shooter had barricaded himself for this murder spree. They were left with no choice but to end his life and shoot him dead. Fourteen people were killed at the scene, not including the shooter. Thirty-one were injured, and sadly, one of those victims died years later from complications of the injuries. Now, I've covered some mass shootings before on this podcast, but this one is a little different. So without further ado, let's get into the University of Texas shooting of 1966, a.k.a. the murder spree of Charles Joseph Whitman. Charles Joseph Whitman was born on June 24, 1941, in Lake Worth, Florida. He was the oldest of three sons of Margaret and Charles Adolphus Whitman, Jr. His father was a plumber who was described as a perfectionist and overbearing. As per the times, Margaret was a stay-at-home mom, but she was also a devout Roman Catholic who took her sons to church regularly. In fact, they all served as altar boys for their church, Sacred Heart. Fun fact, I was also an altar person. Um, I did that for a couple years just because, you know, as you get older, church gets boring. So I tried to make something and tried to make it interesting for myself. You know, I tried to, you know, do that. But obviously it didn't work because I'm retired not only from altar serving, but from being a Catholic. As a child, Charles was said to be a really polite kid who rarely lost his temperature temperature his temper my goodness 
He was also said to be very intelligent, something I do not sound right now with all of my going on. (laughs) But yeah, it was said he had like an IQ of over 130, which is high. I think like really high. Um, So yeah, so he was just super smart, but he was also an excellent shot. Charles's father was also a gun collector and enthusiast. So, of course, he taught all of his kids how to shoot, clean, and maintain guns. At the age of 11, Charles joined the Boy Scouts and would become the youngest Eagle Scout at the time, just a year later at age 12. Sadly, also per the Times, Charles' father was physically abusive to not only his three sons, but his wife as well. This, of course, made Charles eager, you know, to get the fuck out of there. So what he decided to do was enlist in the Marines in July of 1959. Now, like I said, he had a really high IQ and some people would be like, well, why didn't he choose college? Despite being like super smart and intelligent, Charles really didn't do good in school. And I'm wondering, you know, it didn't say specifically, but maybe he was just bored or he just wasn't interested in anything he had to learn. Um, I don't know. Either way, or he just didn't do well in school, didn't do well with tests. You know, there could be a number of factors. You know, I hate that like testing is a factor in this because it's really just how well you memorize things. And that varies from person to person. But, you know, it could have been any of those things. So for that reason, he didn't go to college. Charles went on to have some success in the Marines. He qualified as a sharpshooter in boot camp and served 18 months at Guantanamo Bay Naval Base, which from what I can tell is a pretty prestigious, like best of the best type of a um, assignment, essentially, essentially. He also earned the rank of officer when he was in training school. He also then earned a scholarship through the military to study mechanical engineering at the University of Texas in Austin, and he enrolled in September of 1961. During this time, his little stint in college here, he met his first wife, or he met his wife, I should say, not his first wife. I am tripping over all of my words today. My goodness. He met his future wife another student of the University of Texas named Kathleen Lesner or Leesner. Again, we know all about my issues of pronouncing names with pronouncing names. The couple married shortly after in August of 1962. And some sources say that they picked the 22nd wedding anniversary of Charles's parents. Like they picked that date. So... Kind of cute, I guess. Now, in February of 1963, so a year-ish later, Charles is recalled to active duty because of his poor grades. So, sadly, he wasn't doing much better in school. So, because of this, and I'm sure it's in the terms of his scholarship, he had to, you know, be called back to active duty. He was then discharged from the Marines in the following December. And I think that was of his own choice. It didn't say that he was dishonorably discharged or anything. I think he just decided like his contract was up and he just wanted to be done. He then decided to return to the University of Texas in Austin in 18 in 1965. But this time he wanted to study architectural engineering. In March of 1966, Charles's parents decide to get divorced, specifically Charles's mom. It seems that she, you know, had enough of her husband's abuse and just wanted to be done with that marriage and decided to move to Texas to be near Charles, which to me makes total sense. You know, if she was going to live near any of her children, of course, I feel like she is going to be near the one who is going to most likely, in theory be expecting children, you know, and would want to be around for that. So it seems like that's why she moved. I haven't seen it for sure, but that's my guess. A lot of experts and um, physicians and stuff think that this divorce, his parents' divorce, 
was sort of a trigger in this whole down spiral before, you know, Charles deciding to shoot and kill a bunch of people. However, I think that might be, I think it could potentially be something that upset him, but I don't think it was the trigger that people think it is because between 65 and 66 Charles had started seeing physicians at the university and he was complaining of feeling rage confusion and struggling with violent impulses now aside from the physician notes of course from him seeing them Charles also wrote these feelings down extensively He was, of course, given a multitude of medications for his symptoms. I mean, again, it's 65, 66. We don't know all about mental health and things like we do now because there is another component, a physical one, which I think was also something that doctors weren't and just science was not fully aware of or, you know, maybe not as hyper aware of the types of symptoms because... Shortly after his parents' divorce, Charles went back to the University Health Center and spoke with one of the psychiatrists. In addition to his initial symptoms, he was now also experiencing headaches. Yeah. We're going to get into that in part two. So just remember that he was also, aside from the rage, confusion, and violent impulses, he was also now getting headaches. The psychiatrist, of course, advised Charles that he needed to come back for further counseling. But sadly, Charles never did. Imagine that you're riding the Turner Classic Movie Great Movie Ride in Hollywood Studios. It's in the 1990s. As you're journeying through the Great Movie Ride, you pass the Wizard of Oz where all of a sudden you see the Wicked Witch of the West ascend into Munchkinland in a cloud of smoke and flames. Well, that's the memory I have with the great movie ride in classic cinema when I was at Disney in the 1990s as a young boy. And ever since that, I was hooked on classic cinema. Well, my friend Christian Garcia, friend of the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, has a podcast that you all are going to love. It's called That Old Gay Classic Cinema, and he looks at queer themes in classic cinema, like Vertigo, The Wizard of Oz, Sleeping Beauty, Mary Poppins, 101 Dalmatians, Hello Dolly, the list can go on and on and on. So follow him on Instagram at That Old Gay Classic Cinema. You can listen to his podcast on Apple and Spotify. Spotify. And he also is on the premiere episode of our Queer as Folk podcast, where I'm rewatching every episode of Queer as Folk from 2000. And the episodes come out bi weekly. So make sure you listen to his episode with me. And he's launching a rewatch show of Smash, where they're putting on a Marilyn Monroe musical. So he's going to be joined by co-hosts, a lot who are in the Broadway and theater industry, and I'm going to be on his first episode. So without further ado, get listening to That Old Gay Classic Cinema. Enjoy. LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? Or have you been moved by an LGBT book, film, painting, television show, or other form of media? Then the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, commentary, and thought pieces in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie. In addition to the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog. So you can see all of this on glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W.org. Remember, you get 50% off your subscription of the GL Review magazine when you use the promo code ITBR50. That's 50% off your print or digital subscription when you use promo code ITBR50. To learn more about submitting an article for the GNLR, Visit their writer's guidelines. The link is located at the bottom of their homepage. And if you have any questions, email Stephen Hemrick. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot 
H E M R I C K at glreview.org. The GNLR and its readers can't wait to see what you have to say. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I'm so excited to shout out the Gay and Lesbian Review, who is helping to sponsor the ITBR podcast. For all of you out there, the Gay and Lesbian Review is a bi monthly magazine where you can discover new things about gay and lesbian literature, history, and culture. And the GL Review publishes essays in a wide range of disciplines, as well as a slew of reviews of books, plays, and movies, and a number of special features, such as artist profiles and their popular art memo column. Each issue of the magazine brings you consistently intelligent, lively, thought provoking articles focused on a unifying theme. For example, their September-October issue centers on the theme Cracking the Closet. So, starting in the 19th century, a number of artists and writers found ways to crack the closet by expressing their sexuality between the lines or in the interstices of their work. For example, Ignacio Darnad, who is a friend of the ITBR podcast, he's been on our show, writes all about illustrator J.C. Leyendecker, whose work for Ivory Soap and Arrow Collars gave him plenty of opportunities to draw pictures of well-dressed and at times scantily dressed American men. And you also can find an article by Vernon Rosario, who has been on the podcast, and he talks about the quest for sex in the Middle Ages. So to subscribe, visit glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W dot org. Click subscribe. So on their website, go all the way over to the right hand side and you'll see the button subscribe. Click subscribe and enter the promo code ITBR50 because you're getting 50% off your subscription to the print or digital edition of the Gay and Lesbian Review magazine. I can't wait for you all to have your copy of the Gay and Lesbian Review magazine and make sure that you take a picture when your magazine arrives or when you're reading it online and tag the GL Review on Instagram and ITBR and we'll share it out in our stories. Enjoy your reading, everyone. After five months of suffering, during the early hours of August 1st, 1966, Charles typed a suicide note where he talked about his violent and irrational thoughts and the mental turmoil that drove him to this point. He then went to his mother's apartment and killed her. Now, the method of murder has been disputed, but it seems that officials stated that they believed that he rendered his mother unconscious and then stabbed her in the heart. I couldn't find exactly how he rendered her. They, you know, wasn't really, those details weren't given out. But my guess is given all of his military training and since it was his mother, he probably used some sort of sleeper chokehold or some sort of other pressure point, you know. And I say that because, and we'll see in a second, like I really do think that he loved his mother and... You know, her body wasn't brutalized, so it didn't seem that, like, he subdued her or rendered her unconscious by hitting her over the head. Charles then took his mother's body, put it in her bed, and covered her with the sheets. Another example of love for his mother, you know, by laying her on her bed and covering her, you know, that is a sign of respect for the dead. Which I know it sounds absolutely insane to be like, yeah, he loved his mother, even though, like I just said, he killed her. Um, We're going to get into that a little bit more, the psychology behind it. But like I said, I really do think, you know, despite that, even though that is a huge fucking thing to do, you know, I really do think that he loved her and really cared about her. Um, He also left a handwritten note with his confession And in this confession, he did state that he really was upset and was sorry for having killed her. And he also expresses his love for his mother and said that he loved her with his whole heart. Which, again, kind of, it makes this sad. And like I said, I know with the whole situation we're about to talk to, this is a very tricky, slippery, weird, just not usually common case but because of that I wanted to talk about it but like I said we will get into that 
After he left his mother's apartment, Charles returned home, went into his bedroom, and stabbed his sleeping wife five times in the chest. Similarly, similarly excuse me, to his mother, he covered his wife's body with the sheets, and she was already in bed, so he didn't have to move her there. He then went to his type note and then took a pen and hand wrote another confession, basically stating that he killed both his mother and his wife. And from there, which is very interesting, like he left instructions, essentially. Not actually, I wouldn't even say like necessarily like instructions, but kind of just like requests. So after saying that this has happened, um, I think he also mentions just, again, some of like the mental turmoil that he's been going through that, again, led him to this point. But then, like I said, lists some requests. So one of the requests he lists is that he wants, if his insurance policy is still valid, he would like the money from his insurance to, you know, cover the rest of his debt, but then be donated anonymously to a mental health foundation. And he wants this because he wants research to be done to prevent other tragedies, or at least that is his hope for wanting this money donated and obviously he would want it donated anonymously because who would want to accept money (laughs) for someone who commits mass murder like we're going to get into in just a second so (laughs) it makes sense he then also asks uh, you know for his body to be cremated after an autopsy and he requests an autopsy specifically because he wants to know if they're well obviously not him to know but just once it to be known if there is any evidence of mental disorder that caused this again it it's interesting that he would write this because everything he's saying is to not repent or you know something like that I just I feel like because he was like I said we'll get into what is going on with him (sighs) I feel like there's a huge struggle and he's trying to do what he can because he know he can't fight this anymore, which is just horrifically sad in its own really fucked up way. So after asking to be uh, given an autopsy to see what's going on with him, he wants to then be cremated. Another thing that I just threw him because I'm a dog person. He also asked that the dog that he shared with Kathleen be given to her parents which i mean you can see here he's really not he's not planning on living after this charles then dressed himself in coveralls so that way he would look like a workman and gathered an m1 carbine a hunting rifle a sawed off shotgun several pistols a machete some knives and a ton of ammunition in a bag, and headed to the University of Texas Austin campus. He arrived there at around 11.30 and entered the University of Texas Tower and made his way to the observation deck just above the 27th floor. On the way, he killed the receptionists and two tourists. Some sources I saw say that he bludgeoned the poor receptionist and shot the two other tourists because they were climbing up to go to the observation deck. He then barricaded the doors of the observation deck reception area and climbed up to the deck. At about 10 minutes before noon, Charles took the life of his first victim. Now, for anyone who... This is going to be rough. That's all I'm going to say. So if you need to skip, skip. But this first, this is... (sighs) The first victim was an unborn child of a pregnant student. He shot this pregnant student directly in the belly, which they said instantly killed her child. His next shot then killed the pregnant student's boyfriend. From then on, bullets rained down from the tower, just raging over an area the size of five city blocks. Police arrived on the scene rather quickly, and other local civilians with their own weapons arrived to help. 
It's important to remember that this was the 60s. And I just want to point that out because the types of rapid response teams, mass shooting procedures, like the shoot- shooting procedures, active shooting procedures in general, and even just the term active shooter did not exist at this point. So to say the least, the response to this is kind of a shit show. However, from what I've seen, thankfully, the people that were trying to help the police and the police, it did not seem like they added to the casualties, thankfully. Um, But yeah, so there were just a bunch of people and there were also multiple departments as well responding. So there was just a bunch going on. It was kind. I mean, the fact that it was already chaos to begin with. I mean, this just added. Now, it's. Like I said, as far as I know, there were no casualties on the police or civilians side. It seemed like they were all shooting up at Charles at the tower once they realized that's where he was. As more and more people joined in shooting at Charles, he was then forced to take shelter behind the tower and had to shoot. Sorry, if you can hear my computer, my work computer's going off right now. Um, That's what that is. But um, anyway, so because he was behind the tower, they had little water spouts and he had he eventually or not eventually, but he did shoot through the water spouts to continue his reign of terror, if you will. Three officers and an armed civilian without any sort of plan or chain of command bravely decided that they were going to enter the tower and made their way up to the 27th floor and then up to the observation deck. Now, it seems like the one thing or like the one orderly thing that they agreed upon was to surround him, which they were successful. From there, Austin Police Department officers Romero Martinez, I believe that's how you say his first name, and Houston McCoy fatally shot and killed Charles Whitman and thus ended Charles's 90-minute reign of terror. Now, I'm not entirely sure when they discovered the bodies of Kathleen and Margaret. I'm guessing it was after all of this when they went to go contact next of kin. So, you know, because of that, they were also able to find the suicide note, confession, and all of his other writings. The investigation led officers to the University of Texas Health Center where he was being treated and they were able to look at his medical records and doctor's notes which they could see mirrored what they found not only in the suicide note but like I said his other writings there was some hiccup with the hot the autopsy because his body was immediately embalmed at the cook funeral home where it was brought to which I know seems absolutely insane but autopsies especially for the perpetrator of a crime and because they already know cause of death, it's not usually warranted. Um, if you actually go back and, um, or if you remember my interviews with Bruce Goldfarb, he worked at the medical examiner's office in Baltimore, Maryland. Autopsies are not ordered as often as we think they are, thanks to crime shows and everything. Um, so obviously the next logical place for a body or bodies to go to if they're not going to be autopsied would be to a funeral home for um, funeral arrangements and things. Now, because Charles requested an autopsy after his death, authorities were able to obtain permission from Charles's father, who was still alive, and I think living in Florida. The following day, Dr. Coleman D. Shinar, that's what we're going with, people, who is a neuropathologist at, or was a neuropathologist at Austin State Hospital, conducted the autopsy. During it, they found a pecan-sized tumor in Charles's brain. The toxicology was not very surprising just because it revealed that he had been taking the medications that he was prescribed. One of them included Valium. There was also some dispute regarding Dr. Shinar's exact findings about like what type of tumor and things like that. But the general conclusion was that it was possible that the tumor contributed to Charles's inability to control his emotions and actions, which honestly, even at that point was 
even that point was eventually disputed. But it was noted that this was not the reason for why Charles did what he did. Now, since then, science has progressed and, you know, studying killers with brain injuries and tumors has also progressed our understanding of how brain injuries and tumors and violence can be correlated in these horrific situations. Today, we know that these injuries or tumors create impairments in brain functioning and the neural connections in the brain. Now, for those of you who are interested in sports, you might have seen this or heard about this in um, football players and hockey players with CTE, or basically just repeated head injuries. These findings have basically shown that there can be a connection between repeated brain injury and behavioral and mood changes. In Charles's case, depending on you know, what part of the brain the tumor was hitting. I couldn't find it exactly. Some people think it was the amygdala, which would make sense because of what it controls. Um, That would have also had these similar negative symptoms and effects on his personality. Now, being an abused child, as we know, also can cause personality disorders. However, I'm not sure that that's much of a factor in Charles's case necessarily, Um, you know, just because of the tumor. But, I mean, it also could explain some of his feelings of anger and things like that. You know, I feel sympathy for Charles, you know. know, Not for what he did, obviously, because obviously that was extremely horrific and we're going to talk about the free will of it all in a second but in my personal opinion I think that he was really struggling mentally and physically with the headaches and in combination with taking the medications that he might not have necessarily needed to take just snowballed and created this years long suffering that he had been trying to get help for with no avail and as it got worse his ability from a brain functioning standpoint, decreased to the point where he couldn't control it anymore, in my opinion. For the free will of it all, I highly recommend you guys read my source from The Scientific American. They have an in-depth look in brain injury, tumors, etc., and the link to criminal activity. But they also discuss how those brain injuries also damages a person's free will. What I mean by that is, so when you are learning things, your brain is making neural pathways and connections. So literally they're making paths of this. So when the connections that make up your moral compass are injured or disturbed in some way, there it, it links to changes in thoughts and behavior in some way form, which is why I feel like brain injuries, especially to those parts of the brain, are so scary because the injuries can cause a change in your personality. In Charles's case, though, like I said, to me, it seems that the tumor caused an injury to the parts of his brain that keep him grounded, which the amygdala is responsible for those. However, though, you know, we can still see that despite this, He knows that his lack of being able to control himself is wrong and is causing insurmountable pain, not only to himself, but to other people, which is why, you know, the arguments of free will and morality come into play. But like I said, I think, you know, that Charles's situation is absolutely different and, you know, special. I don't want to use that word because it doesn't feel right, but it's the only one I can think of. But, like, because of that, I do think that his ability to love his mother and wife and know right from wrong and all those things coexisted with an injury, well, the tumor, that caused an inability for him to be able to control his violent impulses and emotions. So because of all that, like, that's why I feel sympathy for Charles. And I do believe that this is like this crime is a side of true crime that we don't really 
talk about. And like I said, that's crime caused by a brain injury or tumor, which is why I wanted to talk about it. Because honestly, I don't personally believe that Charles is inherently evil. And had he been well, really want to do this. But obviously that does not excuse what he did. There are 17 people, including his mother, wife, and then the victim who later died from his injuries, who should have been able to live their lives. But they were cut short because of Charles and what he did. The other thing, though, with Charles, like I feel like, though, had he not been killed, and I kind of just want to throw this in here, and they were able, like, to bring him in, even though we know he was planning to die from the get-go. I think that in court and in general, he just would have been extremely remorseful. Again, does not make up for anything. But I, again, just personally think that that is how he would have reacted. But one last time, it does not excuse the fact that he killed, and does not make up for the fact that he killed all of those people. It doesn't. It was said that a joint Catholic funeral was held for both Charles and his mother, Margaret, back in Lake Worth, Florida, a few days later. Surprisingly, I mean, I was honestly surprised that the funeral was able to happen. You know, whatever. Catholics. But I was also surprised that he was buried with military honors. But I guess that's probably because he wasn't dishonorably discharged but I don't know I feel like the murder like his the murders he committed would have like negated that and that they wouldn't have done it but he was given those honors Kathleen's funeral on the other hand her services were not known of but honestly I think that's just that's what's best in the end you know because she really had nothing to do with this and You know, I think it's just better that she was able to be laid to rest and hopefully all of his other victims were as well. I mean, again, it's it's one of those cases. It's just horrific all around. And, you know, again, I just feel grateful that we live in a time that we live in today because we have access to all of this knowledge and all of this, you know, advanced technology that we can you know, hopefully, like, fix these things before something like this happens. All right, my loves, that is all I have for you this week. Thank you all so much for listening. Don't forget to follow True Crime in Academia on Instagram and TikTok at True Crime in Academia or on X slash Twitter at TC in Academia. To listen to this episode completely ad free and have access to the other bonus episodes that I post once a month. Go to I no not Ivory. Go to patreon.com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room and become a subscriber today. All you gotta do is buy me a coffee once a month and you can get all of that and it's wonderful. So <laughs> until next week, my loves, I will see you all later. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby. I want to thank you so much for listening to the ITBR and TCIA episodes. Make sure if you don't follow rate and review us on spotify and apple podcasts also make sure you follow itbr on tiktok and instagram at ivory tower boiler room and tcia on tiktok and instagram at true crime and academia also we have a brand new patreon membership system so i just want to explain it to you all quickly so if you want to become an itbr student it is $5 $5 a month. You get ad-free ITBR and TCIA episodes and video interviews. If you want to become an ITBR professor for $10 a month, you get all of those ad-free benefits, but you also get access to both the ITBR and TCIA book clubs. You can join both book clubs, get ad-free episodes, plus you're going to get all of our extra video episodes. So I am re-watching Queer as Folk, Christian Garcia from That Old Gay Classic Cinema is joining us, and he's re-watching Smash. Um, Mary is going to start to re-watch shows as well. You even get access to 
what I'm calling the ITBR teaches. So if I'm recapping a movie or a TV show, including Barbie, um, Halloween movies and horror films, you get access to that as well. And then I also am offering consultation services. So for $30, you get your first initial consultation with me. It's a one hour private Zoom. I will help create a, your podcast, your media brand. How do you navigate academia as an undergrad or a grad student? Do you need help with technology? It could be teaching tools, Spotify for podcasters, video editor so software. Do you want to expand your social media presence as an artist, writer, podcaster, or academic? Do you want help on how to create a public humanities identity like I've created for myself? So I now I'm offering that consultation service. You can find more info about it on Patreon. And you also can join our book clubs. If you want to just join the ITBR book club or the TCIA book club, you can do that for $4 a month. Patreon.com backslash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. That is P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Thanks to the team, Mary DePippi, our chief contributor. And thank you to our two new interns from Stony Brook University, Jonathan and Sarah. Bye, everyone. Until next time.